It smell. It is February 2nd. It is 2 2 22 today, and we are starting another monthly reading wrap up vlog. I try to vlog the books that I'm reading in the month soon after I've read them so I can share my thoughts with you about how the book made me feel, what the book is about, and what the writing style of the book is. So I've finished two books in. February already and both these books I had read the majority of in January and was able to just finish them in the beginning of February. The first book that I finished in February is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. This is a classic sci-fi horror novel considered like the birth of science fiction because it follows a student of science who wants to figure out dominion over life and death and he does by creating a creature from spare body parts. This is a very famous well-known classic and it follows Victor Frankenstein as he creates this monster and has to deal with the repercussions of creating another human being and what that would entail. It is told in epistolary form from a narrator who meets Frankenstein. It's a very interesting look at what responsibility you have to the people around you and how you create those people, uh, either like Victor Frankenstein as an actual creature or through your actions and your influence over different people. It is a book about family and protecting people and how by treating humans in a humane way you are more likely to protect more people. I never read this book and I read it for the TBR Tackle uh, that KD Books is doing this year. It's a really fun readathon, reading challenge, reading game, booktube game. So if you want to head over to his channel and check that out, I highly recommend it. I'm really glad that I read this book and finally see what this book actually is and not just what my kind of pop culture osmosis interpretation of this book is. It was definitely harder to read than I thought it was going to be. The language is very dated. There's a lot of thous and they and thither and things like that. It was written in 1818, which really isn't that long ago, but this feels like a very classic classic to me, and that is not my favorite type of book. It was hard to read. I read it on audio and it was narrated by Dan Stevens. I did like his reading and I was glad to be able to read it on audio but have a physical copy so that I could go through and reread passages if I needed to and there were a couple of moments where I did need that where I needed to rewind the audiobook because there were things that I found confusing. I do think that this book suffered a little bit from being too meandering, being too vast, and I'm not sure if that was metaphor or meant to be part of the story in and of itself, but it definitely like is a very sweeping novel. It goes to very different places and different locations and these amazing things. And to me, honestly, it just felt like Mary Shelley was trying to shoehorn in some of the places that she wished she could go or the adventures that she wished she could have and they didn't really make sense in the story necessarily. I mean it's crazy to say that a classic novel needs an editor but I think that this could have been edited down by maybe 60 to 100 pages and been a much more concise and meaningful story. I obviously don't love it as much as many people and especially many booktubers love Frankenstein and feel a connection or a closeness with this book but I'm super happy that I've read it and I think that Mary Shelley's life was extremely interesting so I think that I definitely want to read more of her work and read more about her life and learn more about her time period of writing. I don't think this book particularly made me feel any way. I I said maybe frustrated. I think that Frankenstein makes a lot of really stupid choices. He's almost like one of those people who can't see the forest through the trees. He has this great self-awareness in a lot of ways and then he has no self-awareness in other ways. He has this great awareness of how people act and then he has no idea like what the creature is going to do or how it's going to impact him. Frankenstein's pretty 
selfish in many ways and I think that that was just like really frustrating and so I think I was surprised and shocked but also frustrated at a lot of his choices and a lot of the things going on in this book and actually it's kind of mirrored by the monster so maybe that's saying something. I do think that this is a book that I would want to reread and I bet I would get even more out of or if I watched a bunch of videos or a bunch of commentary on this book I would get more out of it. So maybe in a few years I will watch that and then reread the book. That was the first book I read in February. The second book that I read in February was We Have Always Lived in the Castle. I started this in the beginning of January and then I put it down for like three weeks and then I finished it all yesterday. So I had about 50% of the book to go. It's extremely short novella about two girls who live in their family home with their ailing uncle. The townspeople are afraid of them and don't like them and the older sister Constance never leaves the house. She never goes into town. But Mary Catherine, the younger sister and the sister that we follow throughout this book, does go into town to do shopping. And as she does in the beginning of the book, you learn more about how much the townspeople hate them and ostracize them, and also why they are ostracized. There was a tragic event that happened to their family and the suspicion that Constance was the cause. This book follows Mary Catherine and Constance and Uncle Julian as they navigate their lives and when cousin Charles, their estranged cousin from their uncle who abandoned them and disowned them, comes to town, it sets off a series of events that once again changes their lives. This book was so amazing. This book was incredible. I remember reading The Lottery by Shirley Jackson like a really long time ago, probably in school. I don't remember if it was high school or before then. I remember it being impactful, but also like one of those things that you like barely remember and is just kind of part of your consciousness, but I don't remember much about it. I had only heard good things about Shirley Jackson since then, and I was really excited to read this one. I got this one for Booktube Spin Spin 5 Book 2. I started reading it right away, but when Cousin Charles comes, I hated Cousin Charles so much, and I was so annoyed that he created all this tension and all this anticipation, which is my least favorite things in books. You just knew bad things were gonna happen. I hate that books make me feel nostalgic a lot of times, but this book definitely made me feel nostalgic. It felt very much like a fairy tale to me, but like a fairy tale that someone was telling me, like that they had made for me in a lot of respects. There's a cat, woods and magic and streams, there's objects imbued with power and importance, there's objects that should be important that aren't, and it just felt very magical to me, very whimsical. There's no actual magic in this book, but it felt very magical to me. It felt very nostalgic and it felt like someone was telling me my own fairy tale. It made me want to like almost have my own rituals and it made me think that some of the things that I do do fall into that ritualistic category. It was written in a way that was very simplistic and straightforward, like it was in its own universe. There's no time or place set in the beginning of this book so you're not really sure when it takes place, you're not really sure where it takes place, you're not really sure of the tragedy and what happened, you think you know but do you know? The meanness and cruelty of the townspeople is has that fairy tale feel to it. So I think the writing style wasn't trying to be a fairy tale but felt very simple and very plain in that way. I definitely would love to reread this one as well. I think because I took such a long pause in between such a very short book, it would be good to read it all at once. And I also think I wouldn't have that horrible anticipation feeling this time because I know what happens. I always vlog all my booktube spin books so you can see my vlog for this book with much more detailed thoughts and I will link it down below. I also am going to be vlogging all my TBR tackle books this year so you can also see a vlog with Frankenstein in it and I will also link that down below. I will catch up with you when I read some more in February. I have read one more book in 
February, and that was Pet by Akweke Meze. I really, really liked this book. It was pretty short and fast-paced. It is considered a middle grade, but I would not call it a middle grade, and I will tell you why once I've told you what this is about. This book is about Jam, who is a teenager. She lives with her mother and father, and she has a best friend, Redemption. She is the epitome of a young woman figuring out what it is to be a young woman and to want to relish in the love of your family, but also be your own independent person. She lives in a place where monsters have been vanquished and there are no bad people doing bad things to good people anymore or so the town believes. They worked hard to exile or rehabilitate all the human monsters that exist, and the people who were in charge of this are called angels in this town. So the angels vanquished the monsters, and this makes the town feel safe. But when Jam meets Pet, who is a monster hunter, Pet kind of shatters that idea. Jam realizes that there still could be monsters in her town and she and Pet need to find one and destroy it. So this mostly follows Pet and Jam as they get to know each other, as we get to know Jam's family, as we get to know Jam's friend Redemption and his family. It's a lot about how seemingly good people can be bad and how people can pretend to be good when they're actually bad and how we have to be ever vigilant to continually reflect on what makes people bad and the bad things that people can do and keep that in check. Pet is seemingly a monster themselves, being a strange and grotesque creature that Jam is initially afraid of, but because Pet only wants to help Jam and her family, Jam eventually decides that this creature creature, although looking horrific, is not horrific, and the horrors come from real life. Although people thought that there were no more real life horrors, there certainly still are. The reason that I say this is not middle grade, or I wouldn't qualify it as middle grade, or I wouldn't give this to a middle grader, is that there are extremely serious trigger warning topics in here for disassociation and anxiety, for child abuse, for sexual abuse, for assault, for the idea that a safe adult might not be a safe adult for a child. Not that these are topics that I don't think we should talk about with middle grade kids or with young younger children, but I do think that if you were to give this to someone with no context and no discussion, it might be quite upsetting and difficult to understand. Not that those topics shouldn't be discussed, but that without discussion, it might be too harsh of a read for many younger readers. Or the lessons would go over their head and they wouldn't be able to understand the extremely adult and mature concepts in this book. Another reason is that they curse, and I wouldn't necessarily give that to a uh, middle grade person, again, unless there was more discussion around it or unless the cursing was a little bit less. And another reason is that there are a lot of religious topics in this book, and I think that they're done in such a way that also needs explanation. So basically, I think this is just comprehensively above a middle grade level. I would say that this would be perfect for young adult, for older teenagers or young adults. And I thought it was an amazing book, and I really loved it. It's totally Hold very simplistically, which I think is why it's sometimes categorized as middle grade, because the chapters are short and the way that the language is is very simple, but again, the topics are anything but simple. I can't wait to read the prequel to this, which is called Bitter, and it is about Jam's mom, and it is a little bit more about how the monsters were discovered in their town, and I'm just really excited for it. This was the third book that I read in February, and I will catch up with you when I read some more.
It is February 16th and I have finished three more books in February. I finished Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. This won the National Book Prize in 2021. This is a contemporary book but it follows two storylines. One set a little bit further in the past in one of the southern states, I think it was South Carolina, and one in the current day where a unnamed writer is going on his first book tour, promoting his first book, Hell of a Book. I didn't know what to expect from this. I got this book from a little free library. It's an interesting book because there's dual timelines that you assume are going to come together at some point. And because they're not too far distance in time, even though one is a little bit further in the past, you definitely can see that these two storylines could intertwine. They're not like a super far history and a very recent history. They're both kind of around the same time, within 30 years. I think this book was mainly about the Black experience, both in the recent past and in the current day. It talks a lot in the past timeline about how Black parents want to keep their children safe and one of the ways that they do that is by disciplining them. It talks a lot about the discipline that black parents hand down is a loving discipline even if it is violent. The kind of idea behind that is that if they don't discipline their child and if they don't show them how to behave in front of especially white people, then the next person who disciplines their child is not doing it th through love. There is a line in this book where a mother says, I beat you because I love you, and or something like that. And the next person who beats you, the cop who beats you, the society who beats you, the racist who beats you, isn't, isn't loving you, they're trying to kill you. And I think that's kind of a good overall theme for this book. Even the things that the current timeline talks about are all ways of a black man, this black author, protecting himself against something that's far worse. So he drinks too much and he has one night stands to protect himself from the rejection that he is most likely going to get from lovers or from society. He drinks too much to numb himself towards the constant violence that we see in the news. He projects himself not as a black man, he sees himself sometimes not as a black man to protect himself from the hurt and shame and guilt he feels for being a black man and that society has forced on him. I guess the other arcing theme is how the violence and racism and discipline from parents and societal ambivalence towards the black experience is too much to handle. And he feels that way as a contemporary black man. He doesn't have enough space for the sadness of seeing black children gunned down. He doesn't have enough space for seeing black men imprisoned. He doesn't have enough space for the sadness of those constant events that you are constantly seeing. And he hides from that a lot of the time. And in our past storyline, that's kind of what this boy's parents are trying to instill in him, is there's all these horrible things. And it has a reoccurring theme of escaping those things by whatever means you can. So it's an interesting idea of how we hide from the realities of what is currently happening to the Black community and what the Black experience is, because it, sometimes it's too big, it's too much, it's too sad, it's too heartbreaking, and it's too much to take in but how hiding from those things don't make those things go away. While this is a book about the Black experience written by a Black man, I think a lot of white people could gain from reading this book to see, one, what those experiences are like, and two, that just by pretending that that doesn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's a lot of fabulism in this book because our main character does 
have a condition where his imagination runs wild and he sees animals or he sees trees growing out of rooms or he sees his dead ancestors or he sees his past self and he doesn't know what reality is and again that's one of the techniques that he's devised for not having to fully participate in reality because reality is too treacherous. I think it was a little long, I think it was a little overwritten, and I think that this book didn't connect the two storylines or get to the point in a quick enough manner. Because he disconnects from reality, you get a lot of him saying he's disconnecting from reality and you're not sure what's actually happening and you're not sure as the reader what's real and what's false. Although I think it's made quite clear what is real and what is false and you do kind of know what's going to happen, so I wish there was a little less of that fabulous descriptive writing and a little more of getting to the point of the idea that no matter how much you don't want these things to happen, or no matter how hard or big they are, they are happening, so we need to face those realities. I think like the moral of this book needed a little bit more time put into it, as opposed to the character development of these two characters, because really these two characters are not that complex, and since you know that the two people are going to meet up eventually, you kind of just want to get there and like hear what the deal was. I kind of understand why this was the national book winner in that although there are fabulous aspects, it is a book that plainly states like this is happening, people are being murdered for no reason, the system is totally messed up, there's no other reason for that than blatant racism. So I think especially last year, it was a good year for a book like this to get a lot of national attention. I don't think that this was like a amazingly written book. I don't think that this was a standout experience if you already know some of the things that it talks about. If you don't, maybe it was, but I don't think that like technically this book was like so amazing. I would love to read more Jason Mott. He's written quite a few books. I would like to read other books that he's written to see if these themes carry over or if this was a totally new approach for him. Overall I would definitely suggest it. It was a pretty quick read. It was not difficult in its reading or writing style, but it was difficult in its subject matter. Obviously check trigger warnings and things like that, and I would say that if the racism and shootings and deaths in the news are difficult, this book is going for you, which they should be, this book is also going to be difficult. Those were the most difficult aspects for me, having to relive those news items that I've lived through that are devastating and, you know, having to kind of relive my powerlessness again was probably the most difficult part. And then I finished The Black Flamingo by Dean Ada. This is a novel told in verse. It is a young adult novel about a young man, Michael, who comes out at a fairly early age in high school, but is still looking for his identity as a man and as a gay man. He's still looking for his place in some sort of community. I really, really enjoyed this. It's gotten a ton of booktube hype. I know a lot of big booktubers like Meg with Books really enjoyed this book, and I wasn't sure I was gonna like it. I don't really really read a lot of YA, but I would say this is like borderline YA and new adult. I think this could be enjoyed by anyone. Writing in verse is always an interesting choice because it does mean it reads very quickly, it does get emotions across without a lot of filler. So it was interesting to read about Michael's childhood, how he was kind of neglected and abandoned by his father who was black, even though he still was connected with 
his family on that side who were Jamaican. It's an interesting look at being multiracial and being queer about the connections you make and how you make them with people, but also about a young man without a primary male to look up to. So he was raised by his mother and he lived with his mother and his sister and he didn't have a strong male role model to teach him about sex, about coming out, about finding his identity. And it follows him from being a small, small child to going to university and how he is at every step looking for a community to help him along the way. I think that there are a lot of tough things in this book. There's um, internalized racism, internalized homophobia. There is not sexual assault, but the potential for sexual assault. There is racism, obviously. There is homophobia, obviously. But I think ultimately this was a happy book. Not too happy, but happy. And again, that is something that you rarely see in a Black narrative, and that is something that you rarely see in a queer narrative. So it was really nice to read something about someone who you feel like, although they are going to go through so many troubles and so many trials and tribulations in their life, they also are on a good path. Like, I had hope for Michael and his community, which was uplifting and empowering and wonderful. It's wonderful to see a gay man succeeding in finding a community, becoming more of himself, and not having to hide himself away entirely. Obviously this book is also about drag, so that was really interesting. Michael ends up finding out about drag, and we learn about drag with him. That was not the biggest part of the book, but it was a really interesting part of the book, especially for someone like me who doesn't know a ton about drag. And then also Michael being a poet and how his poetry affects his drag, how he takes strength from both those artistic outlets. I would definitely highly recommend it to just about anyone if you're interested in drag, if you are a young man, if you are a young man coming out, if you are queer, if you you are looking for happy black narratives, if you are looking for happy queer narratives, if you are interested in books written in verse, like all these things are so great and it left me with sadness but it left me with happiness and I just definitely highly recommend this one. The next book that I finished in February was Trevor Noah Born a Crime. This is Trevor Noah's memoir. He is a comedian and TV personality. I guess you could say. I actually didn't know anything about Trevor Noah before reading this book. I knew that he had a lot of political commentary, but I'd never seen any of the shows that he had done. I had never seen his comedy. I'd never seen him in a movie. I don't know that much about him, but this memoir is about his time growing up in the 80s and 90s in South Africa, and that really, really interests me. So I picked this one up in a little free library, and I put it on my booktube spin list for the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. This book follows his time from a young child to about his early 20s when he's first starting to garner some fame. This book has stories about about his education and his upbringing, the religious connotations of his mother. He lived with his mother in various sections of Johannesburg and various different sections of South Africa. He was born to a black mother and a white father, which made their lives very difficult because at that time during apartheid, his black mother and him being mixed race would require them to live in separate areas. When he went to visit the black areas, he wasn't allowed to go outside because people might tell government officials that he was in a black area when he should have been in a mixed race area. He talks about his mother's relationship with his father, his relationship with his father, and about how his mother later remarried, how that marriage was destructive and abusive and how she later again remarried. So while this is story 
series about Trevor Noah's life and apartheid and apartheid falling and what happened directly after apartheid. It really is all strung together by his relationship with his mother and his family, about his relationship with his grandmother, his siblings, and his father. This story was really interesting to me because of where he grew up. I don't know anything about South Africa. I don't know anything about the cultures there. I don't know anything really about apartheid because in America we're not taught about any of those things. Again, it was something that the very little bit I know about it is that apartheid was happening, it was bad, Nelson Mandela was put in prison, when he was released apartheid ended, and now everything's fine. Which of course is not true, is not how things are, is not how it went down, but that is what I previously knew about it. So it was super interesting to read this book and learn a little bit more about it. This is definitely a book that made me want to learn a lot more and just explore African culture, South African culture, different sections and tribes because there are Zulu people in South Africa, but there are also Zulu people who live in Northern Africa, like in Kenya. It was interesting to get a little bit more perspective on Africa. Africa to me is like this huge, I mean, I just know there's so many countries, there's so many cultures, there's been so many political movements, there's been so many rights movements, there's been, there's so many religions and communities and theologies and all sorts of things, but it's so big it feels impossible to learn about. So it was really interesting to read this and learn a little bit more about a little section from one person who lived through its eyes. It was also great I read it on audio and Trevor Noah reads the book and he has an amazing South African accent of course and he does all the voices for all the different people and he's able to tell his story really the way he wants it to. He's a comedian so there are funny moments in this book but obviously there are a lot of really difficult things, tragic things that happen, there is a lot of abuse, there's a lot of injustices, so there was difficult things to read in this as well. I would definitely highly recommend listening to him read the book, listening to this on audio if you plan on picking it up, but I would also just highly recommend this at all. If you're interested in comedians and if you like Trevor Noah, I would suggest picking it up, but also if you're interested in South Africa and learning more about what living in South Africa might have been like, I would suggest getting it. Something that I enjoyed about his writing style was that it jumped around in time a little bit. Kind of at the end of every chapter he told a story that wasn't necessarily involved in that chapter or in the timeline of that chapter, but then would expand onto the next chapter. I also really loved that within his own stories he did tell some of the political <laughs> history of South Africa and of apartheid and how that worked, what the aim of the government was. I would have loved to have heard more of that. Those were my favorite parts, even though his story was, of course, extremely compelling. I thought learning about the actual political nature and politics involved in apartheid was fascinating. I would love to read more books on apartheid and South Africa and South African culture, so if you know of any nonfiction books that deal with that more directly, I would love to know. Leave them in the comments below. I'm not much of a comedy person, so I thought this book was interesting because a lot of the comedy aspects of it I didn't really care for. I don't love stand-up comedians and I don't love hearing stories that people think are funny about bodily functions. The parts that I found evoked the most emotion in me were definitely his feelings towards his family, his feelings towards his mother, and then of course the larger look at the racist system that apartheid was and how it was a systemically and specifically racist government designed to segregate and separate people. So those made me feel more emotions than some of the like comedy elements, the coming of age elements. 
I do love coming of age stories, so I did enjoy those aspects of this book as well. But again, ultimately, I think this is a story about family and specifically the relationship that Trevor Noah had with his mother growing up. This was another book similar to hell of a book where he specifically mentions his mother disciplining him through beatings and how she would say that she beat him with love and that it was to teach him lessons so that he understood the repercussions of his actions and so that he understood that his actions would have re repercussions for his whole life and one day it wouldn't be someone who loved him who was beating him it was would be someone who wanted to kill him who was beating him and he was able to experience that within the first 20 years of his life and he really understood where his mother was coming from. I think it's like a very interesting cultural difference that I have read multiple times this month of how parents discipline their children and for what reason. His mother never disciplined him, never beat him through anger. That was really how she knew to protect him from potential worse repercussions that were coming. I've never heard it explained and accepted by the child in the way that kind of Trevor Noah explains and accepts it, which I think was just really interesting. And then also seeing those themes in Hell of a Book. When I read some more, I will let you know. It is February 22nd and I have finished two more books in February. I finished the River Between by Nugi Wa Thiango. Nugi Wa Thiango is a modern classic African author, sometimes compared to Chinua Achibe. The River Between was written in the 1960s. It is about two villages and how these two villages sit on opposite sides of the life-giving river and how they need each other to survive but often are at odds with each other, often are warring against each other. This is mirrored when the white settlers comes in to colonize Africa, brings a missionary which starts to convert Africans to Christianity. So now not only are these two villages kind of at odds, but these two villages are at odds with the white colonizers. Our main character, Wayaki, is the son of a seer who right from the very beginning has kind of a special diplomatic power over his friends and other young boys. His father takes him to a sacred place, lets him know that this prophecy, which calls on a seer to bring unity to the two villages, falls on Waiyaki's shoulders. Waiyaki doesn't necessarily want this burden, but when his father tasks him to going to the white missionary and learning all the white man's secrets, he obeys. He returns to the village to fulfill the village ceremonies and religious rites like circumcision. The white missionaries realize that this circumcision is happening and they cut all ties with any African tribesmen who will not denounce their tribal beliefs and totally conform and convert to Christianity. Waiyaki is left in a weird space because he's been at the mission for many years and he's learned a lot of the white man's education and he really believes in some of those educational aspects but his faith and his beliefs and his loyalties lay with the tribe. He decides that he needs to start schools to help educate the African tribes and to unify the land once again. This is a really interesting book because a lot more things happen in this book. Um, there is a little bit of a love story, there is some tragedy, there are some events that lead the Kikuyu tribes and the white men to be even further apart. There are several Kikuyu that have converted and preach against Waiyaki, his teachings and the tribal traditions. And it's a very compelling story. It goes over our main character's entire life pretty much, or at least from very young childhood through tribal traditions and through tribal ceremonies to his adulthood, to his starting these schools and becoming a great teacher and later in life how although he's tried to create unity for his tribe, create education for his tribe, he comes to roadblocks that he wasn't expecting. 
This book moves along quite quickly. Many years pass you see him as a child, and then you see him as a teenager, and then you see him as an adult. The pace of it was really compelling and interesting. It kept you moving, it was quite pacey in the beginning, but then the last like quarter of the book was quite slow and dragged out and had a lot of miscommunication, had a lot of misunderstandings, had a lot of missed opportunities, and it was kind of hard to focus on that last part. And I feel like the ending was a little ambiguous and it was kind of hard to not have the full resolution that I was hoping for. I read this book for Kieran at Katie Books TBR Tackle February prompt. I'm really glad that I got to it. It's not a translated work. It was written in English and only later did Thiango publish books in his native Kikuyu language, which were quite controversial at the time. He was definitely considered a controversial figure, a volatile and potentially dangerous author. So it was interesting to read something that preached unity but didn't necessarily show us the resolution of unity. I definitely want to read more of his work. The next book that I read in February was a short novella. It's one of those novellas that you get with a subscription. I listened to it free online at one of my audio sites. It was only like an hour and a half long and that was half length by Tiari Jones. Tiari Jones is most famous for An American Marriage and Silver Sparrow, both of which I'm really interested in reading. This short story, Half Light, was about two sisters, twins, who are getting older. They're in their late 40s, and the one sister is in between girlfriends, and the other sister is fairly recently divorced. The divorced sister is our main character, and she has a few regrets about how the divorce went. Her twin has a few regrets as well because her twin was her lawyer. One of the wrongs that they're most preoccupied with writing is that the main character's ex stole a painting from them. One night, they vow to get it back. This is such a short book that really I don't want to talk too much about it, but it was awesome. It was definitely what I needed, a palette cleanser for all the very dark, heavy books that I've been reading this month. There's even been a few books that I tried to read that I had to DNF because the subject matter was just a little too brutal, especially coming with many books that have brutal things. This was just a really nice break. There is a lot of sadness in it, there is a lot of loss, there is injustices that these black women face, but also there is hope and there is sisterly love and there is woman love and the idea that an older divorced woman isn't always bitter or unhappy and that she can still take care of and foster other women in her life even when they're doing things that she doesn't necessarily think is the right thing to do. This is just like really short, really sharp. Definitely would recommend this to anyone who is looking for a realistic but positive, hopeful, happy book about black women. I've read quite a few sad and heavy and hard-hitting books about black women recently, and some of them have really stuck with me and possibly damaged my psyche for all time. So this was just a really nice one to read and enjoy. I definitely look forward to reading more Tiari Jones. After just reading that short novella, I think I would read just about anything that she wrote. Those were two more books that I read in February. It is February 26 and I have read two more books in February. I finished Lakewood by Megan Giddings. This was on my 21 books I found out about in 2021 and I want to read in 2022. It was the first book I finished off that list this year so far and this is about a young woman in college. Her grandmother has recently passed away and her mother has a lot of health bills so when she is asked to participate in medical trials and a health study for money and full medical coverage, she jumps at the chance. She leaves college and performs a series of weird tests to see if she's eligible and then moves to Lakewood, a small town north of where she currently lives, which is somewhere in the Midwest, like Wisconsin area. It's probably Michigan, actually. Yeah. Michigan area. This is an interesting book. It was not what I expected it to be. I kind of thought that the 
medical trials were going to be trying to turn people of color white, and that's not exactly what it is, although there are some elements to that, but it definitely is about what you're willing to go through to help your family, how much you're willing to put yourself through, the discrepancy between people of color in America and white people in America, the idea of being young and not really knowing the consequences of your actions. This is about having to distance yourself from people because of work or relationships, life goals. There's a lot of talk about grief in this book. There's a lot of talk about racism and segregation and a little bit about colorism. Super interesting book. Definitely some body horror, definitely some suspenseful, scary moments, but mostly this is a psychological horror, I think, and what you're willing to go through for someone else and what people are willing to put other people through. I think one of the scariest aspects of this book is that there are these researchers who are doing work on our main character, Lena, and they are ambivalent or indifferent towards her horror and pain. I really, really liked it. I can't wait to see what else Megan Giddings does. There was definitely something at the end that I wish more people that I knew read this book so that I could talk about because I, w I have questions for what my interpretation was and what other people's interpretation of the ending might be. So if you've read this book and you want to discuss it further, I would love to do that. Let me know in the comments below. This book was very uniquely written, I think, because there's a lot of heavy description throughout the book, but our main character is not super well described and I think that was a choice so that we could identify ourselves within the main character, Lena. Even, like, for me, I'm white and the main character is black, but because her physical appearance is not totally given away to me, it let me see more of myself in her. I also think that this was written in a very disparate way, and again, I think that's to mirror kind of her experiences that she's having. And then at the end, there's kind of a tonal shift, and that's like the part that I would really like to talk about. <laughs> Despite it being quite horrific and unsettling, I didn't feel very like nervous or scared or worried in this book. It was more of an anticipation and feeling of like wanting to know the mystery and wanting to know the reasons behind things and wanting to see what how Lena was going to react and what her decisions were gonna be. So it was more of like an exciting anticipatory feeling than like a scared grossed out feeling. Although this was fictional horror it kind of touches on true experiments that have been put on people all over the world but specifically in America and I think one of the more horrific ideas is that it definitely linked current day things and contemporary things that are happening in the U.S. to the idea of experimentation on people and to the idea of secrecy and government involvement. It gave you like a very paranoid feeling, which I really liked. I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist paranoid person anyway, so it spoke to me very directly. I also like that this book didn't just make it some big monster. The big bad in this book wasn't a fake thing. It wasn't a vampire creature or monster. It reminded me a little bit of what When No One Is Watching was trying to do, which is the idea of explaining real horrific things that happen to people of color in America as supernatural issues, which like this one wasn't that, which I appreciated. This one was not like, oh, this is all a monster. This was more rooted in and grounded in reality, which I really appreciated. As we well know, I always get used books, but I've never gotten a book where someone wrote on the cover of the book, like they were writing down a list of things that they had to do and the only paper they had was the jacket of their book, which I think is so interesting, especially because there's like 
blank pages in the back. So you could have written it in the back of the book, but this person wrote it on the jacket. And for a minute I thought maybe it was on the actual jacket artwork, but it's not. It's just a very weird kind of goes with the story list of things. So I, it was very confusing to me, but it's just that someone wrote on the book jacket, which I thought was really interesting. The next book that I finished in February is Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I read this on audio, I found it on a free audio site, and I was interested because I've never read or seen Cosmos by Carl Sagan, and I've never read or seen any of Neil deGrasse Tyson's work or Cosmos when he was on Cosmos or when he ran Cosmos. So I've heard a couple things about him that I like, and I was like, oh, this is a short audiobook. I think it was only like four or five hours, and it just seemed like a really interesting scientific topic explained for people in a hurry. So explained in a way that a layman like myself might be able to understand. I read this book. I really enjoyed it. I listened to the whole thing. I really enjoy Neil deGrasse Tyson's reading, and I liked his writing. He definitely tried to take concepts of astrophysics and explain them using real life examples and situations and explaining words and concepts in a very plain and easy way for someone who is not a scientist, not, not even close to a scientist could understand. But this book still went completely over my head. I don't know anything that he talked about. I can't tell you any of the theories. I can't tell you any of the explanations. I can't tell you anything that happened. I know that he talked about dark matter. I found that really interesting. I know that everything that he said and I listened to was very interesting in concept and in practice, but I have no idea. I don't know at all. Like, uh, so far over my head, so far out of my realm of understanding, I could not tell you anything. So I want to listen to this book again. I really did enjoy it, and I do think that it was an interesting look at science and the science of how the universe may have been created, and the periodic tables, and dark matter, and all sorts of other words that mean like nothing to me, but I want to read more of it. So those are two more books that I read in February, and I will catch up with you if I read some more. It is March, and I finished one more book. I finished Lila, which is by Naima Coster. This is a short story that comes free with one of my subscriptions. I haven't been taking advantage of those subscriptions as much as I should have been because I want to get rid of that particular subscription. So I'm trying to go through a lot of those free audiobooks that I can get and read those so that I can get rid of that subscription. This is a nonfiction novella slash short story about Naima and Lila and how they've been friends since they were young, how they came to be friends, how they influenced each other over the years, and how perhaps at one point in their friendship they thought they were going to be more than just friends, and what that meant for the two of them, and how they felt about that, and how that affected their friendship in later years and what ended up happening to them as they grew up and as they became adults. This was read by the author and I really enjoyed this. It was told in a very concise, kind of no-nonsense, straightforward manner. In a way it was almost like reading someone's journal or diary or that they did a essay on this particular topic. It was very clinical in some ways, and yet it was also very emotional. There was a point involving a th another friend that was really, really sad and made me tear up a little bit. I wouldn't say full-on cry. It's not going to go in my books that made me cry list. I liked the way the style, again, that kind of straightforward style mixed with the just very easy to identify with reality of the story. I like that even though this was incredibly brief, it was emotional and made me feel sad, made me remember missed opportunities, made me think about friends who have come and gone in my life. It definitely was impactful and interesting. And that was the 12th book that I read in February, and I will get back to you with my final wrap-up of 
everything that happened in February. Okay, we're back with the wrap-up to my wrap-up. February was a great reading month. I read 12 books in February. I got to read quite a few classics and modern classics, but I also read quite a few contemporary books. I read some non-fiction. I read a book that was the winner of the National Book Prize. I read a book that was on my 21 books I found out about in 2021, but I want to read in 2022. I read some booktube darlings. I chose to take this month to focus on black authors, although I read a few books by non-black authors in the very beginning of the month. We should be reading diversely and we should be reading black authors every month of the year. So I read so many interesting books this month. I'm really pleased that I was able to read some books on audio. I was able to read some kind of books for younger people. I was able to read a memoir that I've been wanting to get to forever. I was able to read a African modern classic. And I would really like to read more books by almost every author that I read in February, which is an exciting feel to have a bunch of new authors, some of them debuts, some of them modern classicists, and some of them well-known literary writers. I read a lot of very heavy books, a lot of books that had hard-hitting topics, a lot of books that, although maybe they weren't written today, had a lot of impact on today, books that were written today and had a lot of impact on the situations of the world today. So I also was glad to read some things that were a little bit more joyful, had some positive outcomes, or were about science and how that could potentially help our world and where we're at right now. Let me know what you read in February. Did you choose this month to spotlight black authors? Did you read as diversely as you would have liked to this month? That is a very good question. I think that reading so many black authors was great and I think I also read a extreme range of cultures and different ideas dictated by where these authors are coming from. So I really liked that aspect of it. I will see you next month for another a vlog style reading wrap up. Bye! Spoilers! Nothing bad happens to Jonas. The cat is fine.